Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to part one of my cell transport lecture series for freshmen. Today I'm going to be talking about the basics of the cell membrane and just a very, very brief overview of how cellular transport works. So the cell membrane is what we're starting with today. Okay, in my class, I had my kiddos color code the different parts of the cell membrane. You know that it is a fluid mosaic. There's a lot of different parts going on. If you look at different pictures, you're gonna see slightly different things, but we know that we have a cell membrane around the outside of every single cell. And this cell membrane is really important because it's helping to control what's coming in and what's going out of our cells. So there's a half sheet of notes from my kiddos and this goes through that. So we're gonna talk about this really quickly. Okay, and then we're gonna kind of reiterate some of these principles with basic vocabulary and pictures in just a second. So the cell membrane has a couple different functions. One, it's going to help to protect and support the cell. It's literally around the outside of every single one of the cells that's alive, all cells, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, plant, animal, fungi, all of it, right? Every single cell has a cell membrane. Okay, it's going to protect and support the cell. It's going to help regulate and transport uh, materials in and out of the cell. It's gonna control what things are able to enter and what things are able to exit the cell. Okay, this is a really big job and the structure helps it accomplish that job. So the cell, member cell membrane structure is a lipid bilayer. Okay, we know lipids because we already did macromolecules. So we know that lipids are fats, right? Lipids are fats and we have a bilayer now this means two layers. So we have a double layer of phospholipids. This is just a lipid that has a phosphate group on the outside. So it kind of looks like a little lollipop with two squiggly legs, okay? So we have two phospholipid layers here that make up the cell membrane. So as you can see, you have a region here that has all of the, uh, the, <laughs> the phospholipid heads. Words are hard today. The phospholipid heads, which are hydrophilic, which means water loving, hydrophilic, water loving. Inside you have the tails. The tails are kind of hiding. They're not touching the outside environment. They're not touching the inside environment. They're kind of hiding out in the middle here. These are water fearing or hydrophobic regions. So because each of these little phospholipids, this little blue head with the two tails here, okay, because each one of them has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic region, they're known as polar, okay? or they have, um, they have polarity to them. So we have polar heads here that like to interact with water, and we have the nonpolar tails that are afraid of interacting with water. So we have polarity on our membranes. Again, the heads are water loving, hydrophilic. They like to interact with water. You see them on the outside of the cell and on the inside of the cell. And in the middle, we have all the little tails. They're hiding out because they are hydrophobic or water fearing. They are nonpolar and they do not like to touch water. Okay. The model that we currently acknowledge is the fluid mosaic model for our cellular membrane. If you think about a mosaic when you were little, maybe you did a macaroni mosaic for your mom for Mother's Day one year or something. Um, basically, it's just a lot of different parts. And then fluid refers to the fact that it's moving around a whole bunch, right? So you have a whole bunch of different parts that are just kind of crammed together to make our cell membrane, but they're moving around a whole lot. That's why it's called a fluid mosaic model. Okay, our cell membranes are also selectively permeable. This sounds fancy. So to select something you're getting to choose, right? And permeable is referring to the fact that things can pass through it because it is porous. So some substances can pass through the membrane and others can't, it gets to choose. It gets to select which things come in and which things go out. So we're just gonna go over some basic vocabulary. We hit a couple of these, but just this is just the background for the unit. Basic vocabulary. When we're talking about the cell membrane, the cellular membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, the plasma membrane, all of these things are identical. We're always talking about the membrane around the outside of every single cell that's ever been a cell. We're talking about the cell membrane, plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer as the selectively permeable membrane that surrounds every single cell. It's what's around the outside of every single cell. So what's a phospholipid? In my class, again, we color coded. So we have the little hydrophilic heads here and the little two tails that are hydrophobic. Remember, we just talked about how there's polarity here. So we have the head that likes to interact with water. It is a polar phosphate head. And then we have the two little lipid tails that are gonna be on the interior of the membrane. They're sandwiched in that middle section. Okay, they are hydrophobic. They do not like to touch water. A bilayer means two layers, right? So we have two layers shown here, again, with the tails hiding out in the middle. So you put it together, 
What's a phospholipid? What's a bilayer? What is a phospholipid bilayer? It's two layers of our phospholipids that surround every single cell. Okay. And remember that we practice the fluid mosaic model, which means that we have a whole bunch of other parts in there. That's the mosaic part. We got a whole lot of things in there. We have all these different proteins. We have some carbohydrates. We have some cholesterols. All of these things are in there and they're all moving around. That's the fluid part. So our phospholipid bilayer is two layers of phospholipids. So the major component there is going to be a lipid because it's a phospholipid bilayer, right? That has all these little proteins embedded. It has carbohydrate chains on the outside for cell to cell communication. And of course, our little um, cholesterols that are embedded in the lipids themselves in order to help maintain flexibility in the membrane. So we talked about selective permeability or being semi-permeable. This just means that you get to choose what's coming in and what's coming out. So the cell membrane is selectively permeable or semi-permeable. It gets to control what is allowed to pass through and what is not allowed to pass through. It gets to select that. Okay, homeostasis is basically a fancy word for balance. We're gonna talk about that a whole bunch. That's kind of the whole point of the cellular transport unit here, right? This is how the cell membrane that is selectively permeable this is how it controls what can come in and what can come out. And why is it doing this? It's doing it to try to maintain balance in order to make sure that our cells are in healthy environments or to control the things that are coming in or things that are going out in order to make sure that our cells are in a healthy position. Okay, so homeostasis is just a fancy word for balance. It means equilibrium. It's a steady or stable environment for our cells. And we've talked about the fluid mosaic model. I put a little mosaic of a dolphin here. Lots of different parts all working together. And they're fluid because they're constantly in motion, constantly swirling in motion. Okay, so it's a lipid bilayer that is embedded with proteins and carbohydrates and cholesterols, which we just talked about. Um, we have the flexibility due to the cholesterol. It's fluid because everything is constantly moving around. And we have lots of, you know, just these small little molecules that are embedded in all of these lipids. That makes up our fluid mosaic model. So we talked about the words hydrophobic, water-fearing, and hydrophilic, water-loving, just to give you a little visual here. Okay, this is going to be a hydrophobic reaction here that we see because we have the water that is very cohesive. It's all bound up in this little sphere of water sitting on top of a leaf because we know that leaves are typically coated in some kind of waxy substance, like, you know, a lipid, and those are hydrophobic. That's why the tails are in the interior region of our cell membranes. Here you can also see that on glass. And then here you see a hydrophilic reaction. It's more spread out, so it's it's water loving. Okay, so this surface um, here is treated with a different substance, or this could be alcohol, right? And this is a water loving um, example that it likes to interact with water, whereas this surface does not like to interact with water. Next, we're going to talk about gradients and molecule movement. Okay, so if we're looking at a gradient here, I see a large concentration of black dye here. And as you go up, it decreases. So this is a high concentration of black dye. This slowly fades and 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 fades, and fades until there's none left, right? This is a gradient. So when we talk about a concentration gradient, we're kind of looking at like a fade or an ombre effect. This is what we're picturing. I know that it's kind of an abstract idea, but everyone has seen a fade haircut. Everyone has seen ombre hair or ombre tie-dye clothing and things. This is just what we're talking about. It's exactly the same thing. So a gradient where you have a high concentration of something and a low concentration of something. And it kind of looks to me like the black dye is kind of spreading out. It's fading towards the white. Or if you're looking at the white, you can see that the white is kind of fading into the black. And eventually, if you let all these, you know, quote, molecules or particles move around, eventually it would just kind of be a gray color because that would be homeostasis. It's when it's reaching an e equilibrium. It's equal everywhere. So the same thing is happening with molecules. So where are these molecules moving? I see them all moving through a membrane. This is a phospholipid uh, bilayer. We see the lipid tails in the middle and the phosphate heads on the outside. Remember that these are polar and here is a nonpolar region, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. I see a large concentration here, so a high concentration, sorry about that, moving towards a low concentration. I see a high concentration here moving through a protein now to a low concentration. I see a high concentration moving towards a low concentration. Okay, I see just that's exactly how the molecules are moving, high concentration of molecules to a low concentration of molecules. Over here, this one's a little bit different. We've got two different shapes. But what I see moving directly in the picture, I see these like little squares moving. I see two of them here and they're moving this way. 
So there's five of them here. So this is a low concentration moving towards a high concentration. And this one's different because it says this thing right here, ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, which is cellular energy. And it's going the opposite direction. That's interesting. What about this one? Again, we have low concentration moving towards a high concentration. And this little arrow looks strangely familiar. Maybe that means ATP because it's moving the opposite direction of all of these over here. And here I see a high concentration moving towards a low concentration. I see a high concentration moving towards a low concentration. I also don't see any fancy little arrows. I don't think that this requires any ATP, but this one is different. Low concentration to high concentration. And that requires this fancy little arrow. I think that that's going to be important later. So again, we have our cellular membrane, our phospholipid bilayer, our plasma membrane. It's going to look different in all of these different pictures. It's a fluid mosaic model. It's constantly in motion. No two pictures should look alike, right? But we can see the similar components among all of these pictures. You can see that you have phospholipids. It's a phospholipid bilayer. You see all of these little shapes. You can see that you see proteins in all of these proteins going on. You can see carbohydrates. This is your cell-to-cell -cell communication on the outsides. Carbohydrates, 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 right? And then you can also see we've got some little cholesterols going through. These are yellow over here. I'm not sure if this one has any in the picture, but we do have little cholesterols that are helping to maintain the membrane fluidity, okay? So when we talk about biomolecules that we just finished our unit on, in these pictures, I see lipids because phospho lipid bilayer. It's mostly contain containing lipids. I see carbohydrates on the outside used for cell-to-cell -cell communication. I see proteins everywhere used to help transport things. Okay, but notice I don't see any nucleic acids. There are no nucleic acids here because what's a nucleic acid? It's making DNA. It's making RNA. That's your genetic information. That is not found in the cell membrane. So for some reason, a lot of test questions like to ask you about the different biomolecules that you would find in our fluid uh, mosaic membrane here. You would never find nucleic acids here because DNA does not live in the cell membrane. If you're a eukaryotic cell, it lives inside the nucleus. And if you're not, it lives in the nucleoid region or just the center of a prokaryotic cell, which is not the cell membrane. So don't get tripped up by that one. We just studied our four biomolecules and three of those make up the main components of our cell membrane. So we kind of talked about what a cell membrane does. It helps to control what goes in and what goes out of the cell that's called selective permeability. It helps to maintain homeostasis, the fancy word for balance. So we are transporting things across the membrane in order to help reach that homeostasis. Okay, cells want to allow in things like nutrients, water, other needed materials, things to make, a, make proteins like amino acids and things like that. And they wanna release things that are excess, like too many nutrients or waste products, other things that are unnecessary for them. And there's two main types of cellular transport that we will talk about in this unit. We will first talk about passive transport, and then we will talk about active transport. So passive transport is the movement from high concentration to low concentration, which we saw back in those little molecules, where are they moving? And we saw that this didn't require any energy, and we made that prediction. So now I'm putting a name to it, passive transport. Okay, active transport is the opposite direction. When we're going from low concentration up towards high concentration, that's what those little brackets mean, by the way. It's just a lazy way of writing concentration. Okay, and this requires energy. And we saw that arrow that was labeled ATP, adenosine triphosphate, cellular energy. So we have two different classes of cellular transport, active transport and passive transport that we're gonna learn about in the next couple of videos for this unit. But today we learned a little bit about the phospholipid bilayer, the major players, and what it does. And again, it's controlling what's coming in and out of our cells in order to help maintain balance. And the two different types of transport it does is passive transport and active transport, which we'll learn about next. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next one.